<coughs> so we are looking at um, the phenomenon of osmosis and the thing called osmotic pressure Quiet now. Quiet, please. <coughs> We're looking at this, and I realized towards the end of my lecture last week, number one, that I had not completed it, number two, that I had uh, gone through some of the calculations pretty quickly, and I had also um, not been very careful in writing mathematics absolutely accurately at times where I had to write uh, Na, number of particles of type A, I wrote only A, etc., etc. So uh, some of you came up and pointed out those things, so I thought I would actually <coughs> go through the entire process again. Hello, hello. No more talking, please. Um, I will go through the entire thing again and um, get to a point where we can calculate what is called osmotic pressure and uh, then see what people mean by reverse osmosis, a process by which people try and um, clean water. So let me therefore take this example of um, mostly osmosis is used for <clears throat> uh, solving things or uh, dealing with water for example. So water is the solvent. So we have therefore uh, solvent and uh, solute giving rise to solution and we will rather than get into this thing we will say that this is water and this is salt and this is the solution, uh, salt solution. Is not good. How is that now? Kya hua? Is the mic is not working. Up to bilkul nahi karega. Or ab isko karna chahiye. Battery, Oh, this is good. Up <laughs> here, All right, good. So batteries are important. Huh? Okay, so this is uh, water and salt. We will worry about water and salt. And uh, we say that initially, and we will talk of uh, dilute solutions. So the last time, in the last lecture, somebody came up and said, what if you continue adding to it and then what happens at the end? Uh, I think we should all be clear that this is the discussion is going to be valid for dilute solutions where the salt is not, it is, it is not water in salt, but salt in water, okay? Uh, so this will be the case. And we will start by, so, 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 if uh, number of atoms of water are um, uh, denote that by Nw, and number of atoms of salt we denote by Ns, then Nw is much larger than Ns. This is the condition for dilute solution. And <clears throat> said that initially 
there is the Gibbs Fourier energy initially. Initially means pure water. <coughs> And that initially is uh, actually pure water. And that is given by um, uh, G is uh, uh, molar uh, chemical potential. Oh, chemical potential is molar gives free energy. So <coughs> we will have NW times mu W. Uh, and we'll put a zero on top to show that this is the initial one with pure water. <coughs> and this will be a function of T and P. <coughs> we are being a little, um, this, this, this mu could be uh, molar Gibbs free energy or Gibbs free energy per particle. They're all the same. So this is, uh, chemical potential is taken to be Gibbs free energy per particle. Um, so add one salt molecule. And this will change, uh, <clears throat> but one other thing, yes, I think that is also important was pointed out by someone after the last lecture. Um, at constant pressure and temperature. This is atmospheric pressure and atmospheric temperature. This is, these are, all of this thing is done in, under the conditions of atmospheric temperature and pressure. Therefore, these things are all, both the things are constant. So now, because of this adding, there is a change in the Gibbs free energy, and that change, Gibbs free energy is usually U plus PV plus TS, minus TS. This is the definition of Gibbs free energy. So, <clears throat> change in this will be equal to DU plus PDV plus VDP minus TDS minus SDT <clears throat> okay <clears throat> and because it is taking place at constant P and T so DT term and DP terms vanish <coughs> right and we will be left with DU plus uh, PDV minus TDS. So somebody came up last time and said that, look, no, if this is all equal to zero then. Uh, this is because DU is equal to um, TDS minus PDV. This is what we know. And actually, <coughs> this is not true because DU is not just that. DU is uh, uh, PDV minus TD. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> du equal to uh, TDS minus PDV plus mu dn. Okay? And therefore, if du plus PDV is equal, uh, uh, du is equal to TDS minus PDV, and therefore this is not equal to zero, this is equal to mu dn, which is what dg should be. Dg is mu dn. Okay? So this is this this relationship is perfectly valid if we are including dg. So this is an open system where particle flow is also being considered. Sorry? Any question? DDP and minus SDT cancel the same way? We are saying that we are working in cost at cost of pressure and cost of temperature. We are just working on this table, okay? Pressure, atmospheric pressure and atmospheric temperature. Um, now with that, we will also say that, you know, um, DU and D, DU plus PDV 
are the quantities that will depend only upon um, this is increase change in energy uh, and this change in energy will be because of uh, change in interaction. Interaction if you add a particular particle if you add some other particles from outside there will be some change in interaction and they, that change in interaction will be something which will be a function of temperature and pressure. We will just keep it as it is. Okay? And dg therefore change in Gibbs free energy will be FTP and then <coughs> minus T times dS. And here comes some of the, the, the calculation of the change in entropy. When we add a particle to the uh, a, a salt molecule to water, um, there is a change in entropy because that molecule, salt molecule can go and attach itself to any of the water molecules. And because it can get to a number of, there, there are as many number of ways in which um, the added particle can go and uh, attach itself uh, to, to water molecules as there are number of water molecules. This one? Yes. I, I said this is some. This is something which is. Uh, we are focusing only on change in inter, change in entropy, and there is some change in energy which is taking place, which will be a function of temperature and pressure. We know, but we will keep it as as it as it is, and we are only focusing on change in entropy. All right. Um, so this is uh, this change in entropy ds will be k times log omega and num omega is a uh, number of ways in which this thing can happen and that number of ways is number of water molecules okay <clears throat> ds is equal to this and therefore dg is uh, FTP uh, minus K times T times log NW. <coughs> DG is equal to this. Now, now, now we, this, this was only when we added one salt molecule. Add now another salt molecule. The change in dG would be equal to, well, this kind of energy that has gone into this F will be doubled. So twice F Tp. And this will also get doubled because these two molecules can go in twice as many ways to get to attach to water molecules. So twice <coughs> K times T times log log NW. But then on in, in but then there is this <coughs> indistinguishability of salt molecules. So when they uh, there is an overcounting if you don't subtract from this the uh, the, the, the term which is uh, kt times log 2. <coughs> okay? Uh, this is um, what is called the entropy of mixing. Um, there are these many number of ways in which entropy will be increased. This is the amount by which entropy will be increased if the particles are uh, indistinguishable and mixed. And um, adding, suppose then we extend this argument to adding 
an S number of salt molecules we will take this dg to be well ns times uh, f tp well by the way this 2 is not just 2 but it is 2 factorial 2 factorial number of ways in which these two particles can be you know um, they will if they were distinguishable there will be as many different number of ways in which they would go and attach but because they are indistinguishable therefore number of distinct states which is different is lower by this factor and therefore this minus gets uh, this entire quantity gets uh, reduced by this factor and 2 factorial so ns times that minus ns times uh, Uh, log NW and then plus uh, here we will have KT times um, log N salt factorial okay and although we say that N salt is much less than N W and water, um, but still it is very large. And for large numbers, we use a Stirling formula. That log of large number, factorial of large number, is uh, approximately. Um, ns times log of ns minus ns we will use that okay <clears throat> is everything clear all right so we will simply use that in that relationship and write dg equal to um, ns f of T and P minus K T times N S log N W as there and then over here we will multiply K T with these two things plus K times T times N S log N S minus K T times um, NS. This is the change in uh, Gibbs free energy when we add NS number of molecules into uh, into uh, NW uh, molecules of water. Okay. Then <coughs> Total G will become G initial was equal to, we said G initial was equal to GW is equal to this. So G final after this change has taken place will be equal to G initial plus DG. Alright? And G initial was simply equal to NW times mu W and we had put a zero on top to show that this is the chemical potential of pure water. Um, <clears throat> a function of uh, temperature and pressure and then plus DG and DG is all of this uh, and S times some function of temperature and pressure minus kt times ns log nw plus kt times ns log ns minus kt times 
and S. Did I leave out anything? Uh, no, it's fine. And then I know how I can calculate chemical potentials in the solution. Chemical potentials in the solution. There will be chemical potential of water in the solution. There will be chemical potential of salt in the chemical in, in the solution. So there will be mu water in the solution, and there will be mu salt in the solution. And mu water in the solution, all of this will be equal to dG final by d n d g final by d n in one case it will be n w in the other case it will be n s all right and this we will calculate from here partial differentiation so simple straightforward work in this case it will be mu w zero and then nothing coming from here uh, here it will be minus k times t times ns and when we differentiate log nw by uh, nw it will give you 1 over nw and then nothing from here and nothing from here. So this is the only thing that will be determined mu w, chemical potential of water in the solution. In this case, in the case of salt, the first term does not give anything. The second term gives you this function T and P. And the third term gives you minus k times t times log, w, log uh, nw. The fourth term, will, we will be careful about deriving, de de taking differential of that will be, first it will be differentiating this quantity and then differentiating this quantity. Differentiating this quantity, it will be kt times log ns and next time it will be minus kt times ns times 1 over ns i'm sorry i'm sorry plus okay plus and the last quantity differentiating that will give you minus k times t so these two quantities cancel out And we are left with these three terms, which we can, in fact, um, simplify and write. Let me write down both the equations again. So, in the solution, mu w is equal to mu w of pure water minus k times t times n s over n w and mu salt is equal to this quantity f t p minus and I can actually combine these two terms and I can write this as plus k times t log of ns over nw. So all of this is what I had done yesterday except that I was using a different set of notations. And here we are killer error on what is being, what is uh, being dissolved into what. 
Uh, it is clear from here that chemical potential of water in the solution is less than chemical potential of water, pure water. Right? Chemical potential, if you, when we add something to a pure system, its chemical potential reduces. Okay? This is clear. And um, that the chemical potential of salt um, actually in the solution there wasn't any chemical potential initially and now we add that chemical potential and therefore this slowly increases as we add number of NS. So as NS increases As you increase the amount of salt, uh, mu w decreases and mu salt increases. Good. Now, the basic principle is that uh, the matter flows, if it can flow, like a liquid or a gas, if it can flow, flows towards lower G or mu. Lower chemical potential or lower uh, uh, gives free energy. So it will go towards lower mu and this particular relationship will tell us that uh, uh, pure water will flow towards this solution. So if you have a system in which you have okay in this whole process of osmosis you have to have a partition and in this partition you have uh, a what is called CV permeable uh, wall often the name for it is membrane and membrane is uh, something which is uh, often uh, taken from uh, biological systems where actual natural systems have membranes which allow uh, material to flow across them selectively. And this is semi-permeable in the sense allows uh, water molecules to pass but stop. Uh, sodium chloride molecules. In our example, in other examples it will be different kind of solute and solvent if uh, you have. So solu solute and solvent. So it allows solvent molecules and it stops solute molecules. Okay. So here you have on one side pure H2O and this is solute and here you have solution so this is H2O plus NaCl huh? solute ni solution so H2O is solute ah phir galti kar aha ye angrezi mushkil cheez hai bhai Uh, solvent. Solvent or solute. Okay, did I make similar mistakes somewhere else? No? Or because he mistake? No. Alright. This is solvent and this is uh, 
solution. Okay. इसी बहस से हटने के लिए आज मैंने फॉटर और सॉल्ट खास तौर पे स्पेसिफिकली शुरू से कहना शुरू किया अगर मैं सॉल्यूशन सॉल्वेंट और सॉल्यूट पे रहता तो अब तक दस गलतियां कर चुका होता डी एस को के ओके दिस इज राइट यू आर your point is uh, that this entropy ds is a change in entropy and that should be there should be a d ln d of log n this is what you're saying okay now uh, this is uh, uh, okay so what i will call i will do the following i will say ds is s minus s not okay and s not is something which is arbitrary which i can fix at any value w and w w yes mai q kar raha hu uski wajah to hai magar mai pehle ye explain kar dun ki mai d kyun nahi laga raha i will actually write this as s equal to k log omega and i will say that ds is you know s not is being fixed equal to 0 i can always take that to be 0 so uh, this is this and ds therefore is being taken as this all right and i am taking omega omega is the number of possible ways in which a particular thing can happen and that is number of water molecules available for that uh, um Uh, salt molecule to go to and attach to. Because that additional molecule can go in anywhere over there. It is just one molecule. One molecule, salt molecule. We are saying that this is the situation when we have only um, one molecule. We said. Add one salt molecule. So for one molecule, this will be there will be n w number of ways in which it can uh, go and set, because there are n w number of water molecules. Okay, that is why we said this omega is equal to n w. Sir, when you are talking about pure water where no external molecule has been added, so it would mean that uh, none of the molecule is distinguishable. that the entropy of the system is zero the en entropy of a pure solid sure okay so, okay so s s not we assume that s not is equal to zero right this is what i am assuming okay change in entropy is because this change in entropy with respect to the change in uh, of the water molecules yes so his his point was uh trying to understand this particular thing where i said ds is s minus s not and i can take s not equal to 0 and uh, s is equal to a k log w k log omega as uh, uh, he asked okay so here we are and this is semi permeable wall water molecules can go in from here to here uh, and they can also go in from here to here if uh, they can um water molecules can cross this membrane but uh, sodium chloride molecules cannot cross this membrane and um, who will which thing will cross uh, uh, um to which side because this is the chemical potential over here is mu w0 on that on this side chemical potential of water is mu w and of salt is mu s in the solution and because this is less than this therefore there will be a flow from here to here not from here to here so a spontaneous flow uh a spontaneous flow will be from here to here from solvent to solution 
some people interpret it in the following way. They say that, look, there is a differential of concentration over here. Here there is, um, there is there, there are sodium chloride molecules and here there is no sodium chloride molecule. There is some concentration of salt over here. There is zero concentration on this side. And water actually then flows in here so that it can reduce the concentration of salt on this side. So it tries to get there to reduce the concentration, to uh, equalize the concentration on the two sides, or nearly equalize the concentration. Uh, and that is the same thing as saying that the chemical potential uh, differential uh, is the one which is the driving force, which pushes molecule from one side to the other. Okay. So water flows this way, um, and um, um, the, this is this is obviously, as we said, is uh, called uh, osmosis. And the flow, the phenomenon is called osmosis. And the flow of particles perhaps is as if there is something called an osmotic pressure. As if there is a pressure which is on these water molecules to cross over into onto this side. All right? And that sort of perceived pressure that we think perhaps is what is pushing water molecules onto the other side is called osmotic pressure. And our the question before us is can we calculate the osmotic pressure? So we will spend a few minutes trying to calculate this osmotic pressure. All right. Now, the um, chemical potential. Um, suppose, um, suppose we say that pressure on this side is P one, and pressure on this side is P two. Although there is there isn't any pressure that we have maintained, but this kind of osmotic pressure says that there might be some kind of pressure difference. So it is pressure P1 on this side, pressure P2 on this side. And uh, when pressure P1 and P2 are equal, then the flow will stop. Or um, the flow is because of the chemical potentials. And if we can exert, if, if we can increase pressure over here on this side, solution side, sufficiently enough, we can actually stop particles, water molecules coming in across the membrane. Correct? We can always do that. You can increase pressure on this side so that no water molecule crosses into this side. So we are basically then talking of a pressure which can stop the flow. So we can, from the condition that there can be some pressure on the solution side which can stop molecules, water molecules going on to the other side, we can calculate osmotic pressure. And this is what I will show you how. Um, on the H2O side, uh, uh, solvent side, the chemical potential uh, is mu w. And on the uh, solute side, on the, on the solution side, the chemical potential is um, uh, mu w. I'm sorry, this is uh, on the H2O side, this is um, a thing which is a function of T and pressure P1. We are saying that it is at pressure P1. And on this side, it is the same water which is at temperature and pressure P2, and then minus KT times uh, uh, NS over 
NW. <coughs> so, chemical potential of water on the two sides. On one side it is pure water, on the other side it is water in the solution. Water in the solution has this potential, this chemical potential. And that is what we are, maybe we can put a little W on top to, 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 to show that this is of, we are, we are taking this as the pure water uh, chemical potential. So the chemical potential of water on the two sides is this. And water will uh, stop flowing across the membrane when these two potentials are equal. So mu W naught TP1 is equal to mu W naught TP2 minus K times T and S over NW. This is the condition under which water will stop flowing from one side to the other. Yes, you have a question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So we are we said that we are performing this experiment at uh, constant pressure, but we said that because of this flow, this flow would be as if there is something. There is a pressure in. Although there is uh, the the flow is because of difference in chemical potential. But then um, we can stop the flow by exerting pressure over here on this side. Right? If we increase the pressure on this side, then this molecule will, can, can be stopped to flow in. And therefore they, there is a pressure difference can always be envisaged to exist between the two sides. And therefore, chemical potentials will be some functions of these pressures, P1 and P2. All right. And we will say that, look, uh, P2 is uh, nearly equal to P1. Not very different. And um, if it is not very different, we can actually um, expand. I'm going to do this. Uh, uh, mathematical exercise expand uh, mu w um, not tp2 which is this thing about um, mu w not tp1 See, when, when pressures are not very different, then you can expand this quantity about this quantity as um, in powers of P2 minus P1. Okay? You can do that. And if you do this, this will be um, NW uh, mu W zero. What is happening? Okay. Um, mu W uh, P two and T or T or P two is e roughly equal to mu W. Uh, P1 and T and then plus P2 minus P1 times D mu W by DP evaluated at P2 equal to P1. This is approximately the expansion that we will use. We will not take higher powers of P2 minus P1. This is the usual Taylor expansion. And we will substitute now this quantity 
for uh, the thing on the right hand side and that equation in the middle so becomes mu w 0 uh, t p 1 is approximately equal to or maybe equal to this quantity mu w 0 you should think this is 0 of course and this is 0 of course so this is 0 uh, t p 1 <coughs> plus p 2 minus p 1 times differential, partial differential of dwz, mu w0 divided off with respect to p, evaluated at p2 equal to p1. And then lastly, minus kt times ns over nw. Now, this allows us to calculate P2 minus P1 times D mu W by DP equal to KT times NS over NW. P2 minus P1 is called osmotic pressure. P2 minus P1 will be called osmotic pressure and this d mu by dp, mu you know is uh, um, g over n. So d, d mu by dp is like d 1 over n times dg by dp. And dg by dp is v, so it is v over n. So d mu by dp is v over n. And um, this is at W, so N is NW. So if it is W here, then this is W here, and this is W here. And therefore, interesting result comes out. P2 minus P1 is equal to uh, K times T times N S over V. Osmotic pressure is the pressure that, you know, if you want to um, um, this is the pressure because of which the particles are moving. And therefore, if you want um, to stop the flow of um, particles, you will actually put this equal to zero. If you put this equal to zero, particles will stop flowing. But then how do you read this? Here, if you remember, PV equal to NKT is the equation or P is equal to NKT over V, it looks exactly like that. It is as if this is the pressure exerted by particles behaving like an ideal gas. Salt particles behaving like an ideal gas. This is pressure exerted by salt particles behaving as in ideal gas. All right. And this is called osmotic pressure. And of this, since P2 is the pressure on this side, if you can have uh, P2 greater than, P2 is equal to P1 plus K times T times NS over V. So for any pressure 
P greater than P2, you have what is called a reverse osmosis. The reverse osmosis is you take you, you you push water through such a membrane from the side of higher concentration into side of the lower concentration. So if you take a sea water and make it through reverse osmosis, put pressure on the side of the solution and let it pass through some membrane, um, salt will be left behind and water will pass through and you will be able to purify salt water. Um, this is what is used as uh, reverse, in reverse osmosis and for that to uh, be possible that pressure that you exert should be greater than P2, should be greater than this kind of, this pressure. Okay. That is the end of this discussion on dilute solutions that I started over there. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what uh, uh, we learned in chemistry that there isn't anything like NaCl molecules. There is nothing like? NaCl molecules. Eh? NaCl molecules. They oh. use as an ions. Oh, so you are, you learnt somewhere. Are you a student of chemistry? Uh, no, but we learned it. Oh, you learned it. Okay. So you're saying that um, it, there isn't anything called NaCl molecule. It is only an ion. Um, no, it is a, it is a molecule. Uh, it is called an ionic molecule because of um, um, this uh, nature that uh, Na and Cl both individually uh, ionize themselves to be able to connect to each other. So one of them uh, denotes an electron to the other uh, to complete the shell on either side, on both the sides and uh, that is why both of them exist in ionic state and the whole solid is or this material is called ionic uh, salt, ionic solid. Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. That that is, uh, you classify various substances into the kind of bondings that exist between them, and this bonding is ionic bonding. Okay. So is that okay? Or any more questions? Or uh, yeah. I'm sorry? I couldn't hear a bit, a word. <laughs> so it's solute potential. Solute, potential. chemical potential of the solute? Yeah. yeah. So which term would that be? Chemical potential of the solute, we didn't do that. We didn't do, we didn't take that in this particular formulation because we were only looking at what can stop water molecules. Okay, we were only looking at the dynamics of water molecules, so we did not consider the chemical potential of solute of, 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 of yeah, solute of salt uh, in this case. That is here, and we didn't even calculate, and therefore we didn't even bother to see what F was, right? Okay. Any other question? Uh, P is the pressure exerted by us. Yes. So the question that he is asking is, in this reverse osmosis, is P the, is P the pressure that we exert? Yes. At this, when P2 is equal to P1, osmosis will stop. And when P, we exert pressure P greater than P2, then Reverse osmosis will take place. If NaCl existed, there would be a factor of three over there instead of two. Because they ah. go separately to different water molecules. I'm sorry? If NaCl existed. Okay, now, the, now he's getting into uh, details of uh, statistical calculation. He's saying that if NaCl, uh, because water molecule has this uh, oxygen and hydrogen 
and uh, there are two hydrogens and therefore water molecule will go and attach to NaCl will go and NaCl will go and Na will attach to a different water molecule and Cl will go to a different water molecule so there could be a factor of okay so is this a now this is a solution is this something in which uh, chemical reaction takes place or not so if the chemical reaction doesn't take place then um, Na and Cl don't separate from each other. They remain together. Okay? Uh, so, so that question doesn't arise. Water polar molecule. Water polar molecule. Water polar molecule, hey, yes. Okay. Anyway, um, this is. Uh, now, I want to take on from here, and we have uh, two more lectures to go after this. And uh, we said initially that we would, we had introduced statistical mechanics earlier in a very brief way and you want to now get into uh, tasting statistical mechanics a little bit more. Eh? Get a taste of statistical mechanics. Um, so I am going to start now elements of statistical mechanics. And in these uh, two and a quarter lectures, hopefully we will have enough uh, basic understanding with application of elementary statistical mechanics. So this is elements of statistical thermodynamics. Thermodynamics done by the ways of statistical mechanics. Um, and let me re let me repeat uh, some of the things that I that we um, said in one of the earlier lectures. That we the purpose thermodynamics is all about calculating. Uh, macroscopic properties, properties of large-scale systems. So this is about large-scale systems. <laughs> systems whose uh, volume and number and uh, um, total energy and temperature and pressure and things of this kind can be defined, large-scale systems. <clears throat> um, when we talk of statistical thermodynamics, we try and obtain these through <clears throat> uh, properties through uh, uh, microscopic considerations. And microscopic considerations, and um, we try and uh, use uh, the dynamics of individual particles, atoms, or molecules, or uh, electrons, or whatever, and uh, try and use their dynamics, information about them, to calculate large scale properties of systems. Okay? Uh, properties of these uh, through macroscopic considerations. <clears throat> um, in thermodynamics, all the quantities are, um, all quantities are statistical averages.
all the quantities are statistical averages. And average over what? Average over um, all possible states that system can, all possible over all possible uh, microscopically distinct states of the system. So, a system would have a, a, a four particle system, say for example, um, will have A, B, C, D particles, and this arrangement could be different arrangements, you know, A here and B here and C here and D here, and A here and B here and C here and D here, etc., etc. Uh, there can be different ways in which all of these particles can be arranged in microscopically distinct ways. And uh, from all that microscopically distinct states of the system, you took, take an average and that defines those average, average quantities which are actually the thermodynamic quantities. This is the whole idea behind the statistical mechanics and statistical thermodynamics. Um, and therefore, um, uh, and, and as we said, we have, uh, we, we, we prepare uh, or uh, take averages in two possible ways. For example, if you have a coin and you want to toss a coin and find out how many times a head comes and how many times a tail comes, you will flip it a number of times. And the larger the number of times, the greater is the accuracy. And therefore, you can take a coin and flip it a million times sitting over here if you have time. And then you will see at the end that half the time it was head, half the time it was tail. And that um, um, if you were to do it in a very small number of times, the result will be inaccurate. The larger the number of times you do this, the more accurate is the result, okay? This is one way of doing it. The other way is that you take a million coins, put them here, and simultaneously flip all of them, and see how many of them came up with head up, and how many with uh, tail up. And there is a fundamental theorem that people use, which is called, uh, well, the name is very fancy, but which says both these ways will give you identical results. So you can use either this or that. So you can use a time averaging. You can take a system and you try and do this again and again and again and again, and if you have, suppose you have to do something if you have to flip a coin a million times or 10 million times, then certainly you will require a very, very large amount of time to do this. Uh, but because of this theorem, you can actually um, prepare a million, 10 million coins and flip them all together if you have 10 million people standing side by side and then count how many times it has come up. Uh, and therefore you will get the average. So these two possible ways would be equal, and this is a basic fundamental hypothesis. Um, let me write down the name, uh, ergodic hypothesis. Name is very fancy, don't worry about that. But this is what is a fundamental hypothesis of uh, statistical mechanics. Now, we know that we have seen already that entropy is something 
which comes out as S equal to K log omega is the first connection of thermodynamics with uh, statistical mechanics. This was the relation worked out by Boltzmann. And omega is the number of, this number of distinct states of the system is microscopically, microscopically distinct state of the system is uh, what is this omega. And if you know the number of this, then you can calculate entropy from this. And we have discussed this in one of the earlier lectures. Connected it also with uh, um, um, with uncertainty, which is a well-known function in theory of um, probability, and of course uh, Shannon entropy that is often used, etc., etc. Similarly, we also saw that S is uh, minus k times summation over r p r log p r. p r is the probability of finding the system in the rth state. Okay, p r is the probability of the rth state. So, uh, because the probability is something which is only between zero and one, by definition, therefore, log of PR would be a negative quantity and therefore you have a negative sign outside so that entropy is a positive quantity. I think in this series we also were able to equate this with this or if not we can you know, take this to be another way of defining uh, entropy. Similarly, the internal energy that we used in thermodynamics is actually total, there is uh, quite a lot of gossip on the other side on that, in that corner. No. Can you please be quiet? Uh, internal energy is average total energy of the system. Average total energy of the system. Suppose uh, the ith state of the system has energy Ei and the ith state of the system occurs with a probability Pi, then average energy E is the sum over I, each uh, energy multiplied by the probability of that state. This is the standard definition of calculating averages. This is a standard way of calculating averages. So this average, this is the energy of individual microscopic state. This is the probability of that microscopic state. And if you sum over all of them, you get the average energy. And that average energy is what we have been calling the uh, internal energy of the system. Okay. And then other than that, we have uh, the uh, volume and pressure and temperature as quantities which actually are directly measurable quantities um, that we have in, in the lab. So the connection total connect, connection with, the, with, with, the, with thermodynamics is made in the definition of internal energy and entropy. Once we do this, we are through. We can make the connection with thermodynamics. Now, <clears throat> I would take a particular way of looking at things. We know that we said that there are reservoirs. And uh, reservoirs can be reservoirs of uh, heat or energy. And reservoirs can be of uh, heat, ener heat, energy, and 
uh, matter. If you have reservoirs of this, so you connect your system to a reservoir. As I said, we can have a completely isolated system, not connected to any reservoir. You can study that. You can also have a system which is connected to a reservoir. And the reservoirs can be of two kinds, of this kind or of this kind. Um, if you open the window, um, we actually will be connected to a reservoir of this kind, where heat will flow either in or out, depending upon the difference in temperature. And matter will flow in or out, depending upon the difference in chemical potential. If we have a reservoir of this nature, then number of particles do not change. Particles are not exchanged, but energy is exchanged with the reservoir. And when you connect your system to a reservoir, the system comes into equilibrium with the reservoir and acquires and acquires system acquires um, the temperature or chemical potential of the reservoir. Okay, this is what is called come into equilibrium. And we learned this when we talked of the zero's law of thermodynamics. We will <coughs> work with systems connected to an energy reservoir. And therefore, temperature will be defined. System will come into equilibrium with the reservoir. And therefore, the system will acquire that temperature, which is the temperature of the reservoir. The heat will flow between the reservoir and the system only on account of temperature difference. And um, uh, that is how we will. And for that, Probability P of the Rth state was proposed by Mr. Boltzmann as proportional to exponential of minus P E R of the Rth state E R divided by K T. He said the probability of the if the temperature of the system is given, fixed, then the probability of the system will depend up, exist of the probability of the existence of system, occurrence of, of a state will depend upon the energy of the state and will depend at, given, at a given temperature will depend upon exponential of this factor. This factor is called Boltzmann factor. Okay? And I will take up things from here on in the next lecture. Any questions?